Hello friends, how are you? My name is Ari Thurger and today I'm going to talk about divination in the Germanic world. This is the second part of this subject and today I'm going to mostly focus on Cirrhosis. On the previous video I have talked about divination or augury by the observance of horses, birds, of duels between two warriors and a variety of other methods of divination. And I have talked about uh, the casting of lots with signs carved on them, possibly runic inscriptions. Now, if I'm not mistaken, uh, one of my patrons, Mr. Shiva Balashigam, uh, told me he was interested in comparing Norse and Old German methods of divination with Slavic ones. I might someday focus on that, but concerning the casting of lots, it seems the Slavs were much more practical. It seems among the Slavs of the southern regions of the Baltic used lots colored in black on one side and white on the other. Divination process giving a simple answer of yes and no they did not waste much time. Now, that was just a side note. With no more delay, let's start this video. Seers or oracles, divination by intuition and interpretation of visions, dreams and knowing future events through inspiration given by the gods. This is also a form of divination. If you have watched my video about the first Icelandic settlers, in that video, I have given you a few examples about people who had the second sight or gifted with certain powers that gave them the ability to know the future, foreknowledge, premonition, etc. The old Icelandic accounts are a great source of knowledge about these aspects. What is interesting uh, and intriguing to see is that the people who have these sorts of gifts and powers are always somewhat associated with the geographical realities of the land. The divinatory powers by the time Scandinavians settled in Iceland in great part are no longer associated with the casting of lots or the use of magical signs. Mind that I'm talking about. Uh, I, I, I'm not talking about Icelandic magical staves, which in the great majority are from the 15th century onwards. I'm talking about the late Viking Age and late medieval period, uh, when magical staves had not been invented yet. So the first Icelanders had premonitions about the future through intuitions rather than deductions based on the observance or just being in contact with the natural features of the landscape. For instance, a man named Thorstein Rednose was consulted every year and asked which sheep were to be sacrificed to the gods or to any other spiritual entity and he always knew which one to slaughter because he knew which ones were doomed to die. So his choices or his decisions were always wise because no matter what, the sheep he chose to be sacrificed would die anyway for another reason. He, all, he also predicted his own death and the death of all his flocks. Thorstein did not worship the gods, but he worshiped the waterfall near his farmstead. He sacrificed food to the waterfall and presumably his powers came from the waterfall. When he died, all his sheep died too by following one single sheep into the, wa the waterfall. Uh, there was another man uh, named Lodmund the Old who threw the high seat pillars uh, into the sea when he was arriving to Iceland. The high seat pillars are, as I have explained on the video about the first Icelandic settlers, were literally pillars of the Great Hull or the temple back in Norway that were taken by settlers 
and thrown to the sea when coming to shore. The pillars had the gods carved on them. Uh, most of the accounts are carvings of Thor. Uh, this is the animistic notion that uh, the, part, uh, the part of the spiritual essence of divine entities would live inside objects made to resemble their image. So by throwing the pillars into the sea, the objective was to wait until such pillars would wash ashore and so people would settle in that place because the gods, or rather the, the living spiritual entity living inside the pillars, would choose the place to settle. Let the gods decide and let the sea uh, be their vessel. When it comes to the tradition of throwing the high, high seat pillars um, into the sea, it seems to be always referring to Thur, and Thur being carved on at least one of the pillars, since Thur is the god of the sky and storm, and therefore had uh, a special power over the sea itself. Throughout the Viking Age, it was Thur people praised the most on sea voyages, uh, precisely to avoid storms at the sea or at the ocean. But Lord Lodmund, only knew about the place where his high seat pillars had washed ashore three years after he had settled in Iceland. And that was a problem for him. He had settled in a place not decided by the gods. So he quickly made all the preparations to go to his rightful place chosen by the gods. But the problem is not having followed his destiny and the will of the gods, he was cursed. In an attempt to lift the curse, with his powers, he provoked a landslide to completely destroy his house and all the land where he had settled, in an attempt to clear his presence from the place. And then he uttered a curse before leaving to his new land, that no ship that set sail from that place would ever survive the voyage. He tried to pass on his curse to the land itself, to that place. So, these are just two examples, seeking guidance and knowing the future, methods of consultation on what course of action should be taken, wise decisions, etc., based or linked to natural features waterfalls, the sea or the ocean, mountains, the very land itself. This is not as far-fetched as it seems. This is actually a very old tradition which was kept until not that long ago. There are uh, methods of consultation used by the Laps from Lapland, uh, the northern part of Scandinavia, the desire to know a variety of events and on how to proceed and which course of action to take, if one should go on a journey or not, if it was a proper time to hunt, etc. Always making a consultation from the land spirits, the local spirits of the surroundings, making sure people had their goodwill to proceed. Knowing future events based on intuition, by the observance of the land itself and how the land spirits and local spirits behave and manifest their powers through nature. And it's the manifestation of those powers that give the answer to what one wants to know, which, which is very similar to the inspiration of seers among the Germanic people in earlier times. Seers played a very important role in ancient societies and it was no different uh, within the Germanic tradition. Tacitus several times spoke about the importance of women among the Germans. Women that acted as seeresses, whom people consulted to know a variety of things concerning the future. I've already mentioned on the previous video on the first part, uh, Valeda and Audinia, as two good examples of such women. Among Germanic tribes, there were many of such women 
or it seems each tribe had at least one of these women with great authority and with prophetic powers. There was an element of holiness in them, of divinity even, so their gift of prophecy was taken into account and their word was law. As the time passed, these women actually ended up to be revered like goddesses. Many were deified, turned into actual goddesses, and included in the religious tradition of the worshipping of the gods. Quite common among pagans to turn mortals into gods. The Celts used to say, heroes became gods and gods became heroes. There was no direct contact with these women among the, the Germans. Uh, they remained on a high tower and it was one of their relatives that brought the questions to these women and came back with the answers to, the, to those who had asked for these women's guidance. They predicted what was to come. This tradition of consulting wise women, seriouses, prophetesses, was kept until late and there are a variety of Old Norse sagas and poems about such women, which is what we are going to talk about next. Alright, if you have watched the video about terms for magic workers, you are already familiar with certain terms. In the Old Norse tradition, the name used for seriouses sometimes is Spokona, which is a woman with prophetic gifts. The masculine equivalent is Spomadra. Mind that these terms are also used for people with knowledge of magic or spells. It's a term loosely applied to different kinds of realities. But the term specifically used to describe a woman practicing divination is Volva. And the closest tr translation to English is Cirrus and even prophetess. There is no masculine equivalent for this one, however. These women, um, in the great majority, were wanderers, visiting houses and making predictions, uh, or people would seek them out looking for answers. But in earlier times in Scandinavia, the Volva played somewhat the same role as the continental Germanic Cirrus, although in Scandinavia the Volva was more in direct contact with the community instead of being in some structure apart from the community and only reachable through emissaries. The Volva would conduct a ceremony and people of the community and the surroundings were invited to attend. She would uh, reply to questions concerning the future of the community and would give answers to each individual that would ask about personal problems. The divination rite of the Volva was called Seidra, which is why Seidkona is a synonym of Volva. As I've explained before, Seder is quite complex and deals with a lot of realities, but divination is part of Seder, which is why the rite of the Volva concerning divinatory aspects is also called Seder. However, it seems the wandering Volva and the Volva related to Seder, the Seidkona, uh, seem to have been different works. As we shall see just now, judging by the elaborate ceremonies of the Sedkona when comparing to the home visits of the wandering Volva. As I have said, the Volva didn't quite stand on the same physical reality of the Germanic Valeda, but certain aspects of the tradition were kept in Northern Europe. The Volva sat upon a surface or a seat raised above the ground, which is called Seidialr, 
Seder platform. The Volva on her high seat was surrounded by singers who chanted the incantations required. Incantations in the form of singing. Uh, so we are probably dealing in here with Galdr. As I've explained before, Galdr and Seidr only became two distinct arts, so to speak, with Christianization. Galdr wasn't Seidr, but it was part of Seidr, part of the performance in Seidr rituals, the singing incantations in Seidr rites. But we have accounts of the people who accompanied the Volva. Some accounts tell us of 15 youths and 15 maidens, a total of 30 singers. But apparently that depended on the volva and the work needed to be performed. Erix Sogarrauda is by far the best written source we have about uh, the ceremony performed by the volva. Uh, at least in this account the volva asks that a song called Varglokur should be sung. Uh, it wasn't the Volva that sang it, uh, but those singers who accompany the Volva. In this particular account, uh, no one knew the song except a young girl who was a Christian, but had been taught about uh, the song by her nurse during her childhood. I'm not going to explore in this video the song Vardlokur, but as the name implies, Vard being regarded as a spiritual entity, mostly referred to as a sort of guardian or warden, and help, uh, an helping spiritual entity, and the term Lokur, which is to lock, uh, which is the same verbal basis of the name Loki, the deity, uh, to shut in or to bind. Vard Lokur most likely was a song to attract and hold the helping spiritual entity or entities which helped the Volva to obtain knowledge. Which seems uh, exactly what happens in this particular saga uh, by the explanations given. At the same time, the song seems to have uh, the effect of waking up the Volva from her trance and to summon back her spirit, which wandered into whatever reality to obtain knowledge. And so the song would wake her up so she could return to her body. Which is interesting to see that's exactly how in mythology and Old Norse poetry the god Odin, Odin wakes up the dead Cirrus uh, when he wants knowledge from them through Galdr, through singing incantations. This performance has parallels with shamanic ceremonies of Northern Europe, to be more precise, of Northern Northern Europe. Among the laps, a maiden would sing a song to attract back the shaman's spirit. After the song was sung, the shaman would return with answers. So, Vard Lokur seems indeed to be a song to trap the spirit, maybe the helping spirits, but most likely it's to trap the spirit of the shaman or the volva back into the body, since Vard is a spiritual entity also regarded as part of the soul in Norse spirituality. But more about Vard Lokur someday on a future video. <laughs> These performances have been recorded uh, more recently among Eskimos, Laps, Finno-Ugric and Turco-Tatar peoples. Old traditional communities where shamanism uh, plays uh, the major religious and spiritual role of these communities. But before continuing, mind that the Volva is not to be confused with the shaman. The vulva seems to perform certain aspects within shamanism, but not fully shamanism. In shamanism, dancing and drumming are generally used by shamans to induce a state of ecstasy. And the great majority of ceremonies are for 
healing purposes. In Norse accounts of Seder, there isn't any reference of drumming or dancing, nothing of it, just singing by others. And the Volva's purpose in her ceremonies was never concerning healing. So the picture we nowadays have uh, of the Volva and Seder with drums and dancing and healing purposes is incorrect. The Volva was not a healer and drums and dancing were not part of Seder rites. Seder was essentially a divination ceremony and sometimes used for hostile purposes to affect someone's mind, so it wasn't just for good things. I've spoken about Thur uh, previously concerning the, this God's connection to the sea or the ocean and the will of fate and the tradition of throwing the high seat pillars as a form of divination. By the will of the gods, the course of action to be taken is known. But it wasn't just Thur, Freire and Freya, the Vanir deities, must also have been associated with divination. In the video uh, about the first Icelandic settlers, I have talked about a man named Ingimundr, who consults three Finns from Lapland to find his lost talisman of Freyr. The three Finns retire to a hut for three days and after their shamanic performances, in visions and divinatory dreams, they find Ingimundr's talisman of Freyr in Iceland. Ingimundr sets out to Iceland in search for his talisman and ends up settling there. This talisman of Freyr, uh, the Old Norse term for it is Luther, uh, in here, uh, in this account, replaces the high seat pillars. The, ob the object will lead its owner to the site in Iceland which the gods have chosen for him. And I must remind you, if you haven't watched that other video, that Ingimundr is from Norway and uh, he's lost, uh, he lost his talisman in his, his, his homeland, in Norway. He had never set foot in Iceland until, for some reason, his talisman of Freyr is found there, buried in the place where a serious Ingi Mundra consulted before the three Finns, told him that he would uh, make his new home precisely where his talisman was buried. So, there is a long process here of divinatory work until Ingi Mundra follows his destiny and the future that had been revealed to him through divinatory work, all because the talisman of Freyr, or in other words, the god himself, worked out this entire arrangement for Ingimundr. This account can be read in Vetnsdila Saga. On another written source, this time Vigaglum Saga, a man offers an ox to Freyr with a prayer that his enemy may be driven off his land and the ox bellows and falls down dead as a sign that the offering has been accepted by Freyr and that Freyr will grant his request. Gloom, who is the victim of Freyr's decision, is told about this in a dream. Freyr appears to him in a dream, sitting on a chair on the, sh on the seashore, looking angry and Gloom's ancestors tell him that they have tried to change Freyr's mind concerning Gloom's fate, but the god would not change his mind, and so Gloom, Gloom's fate uh, was settled, sealed, and he was driven off the land. Gloom had been told in dreams about his future. It's interesting to see Freyr in this. This is actually one of the very few sagas in which a god in person appears in a prophetic dream. So this might be a reference to an older tradition concerning Freire and consulting the deity for divinatory purposes. Maybe the sacrifice of an ox as a form of augury, as we see in this account. Maybe this was once part of the cult of Freyr. And then, of course, we have Freya. 
as I have mentioned on the video about necromancy uh, in Norse mythology, in the poem Indolyod, Freya acts like a vulva, journeying to the underworld to seek information. She too, like Odin, is able to awake the sleeper, a dead prophetess, while Freya travels the road of the slain, uh, the road that leads to the land of the dead. There are strong evidences that Seidr was connected to the Vanir and with Freya in particular. The Vanir cult was linked to the burial mound, as I have explained on the video about sheep burials. And it was also a cult linked to the ancestors in the underworld. And divination may well have been practiced in their cult places in Norway and Sweden. When Snorre Sturluson writes that it was Freya that taught Seder to Odin and to the other gods, it may be in fact a reference to an old tradition of Seder linked to the Vanir, and therefore divination might have indeed been linked to both Freyr and Freya. And it has been suggested before, and I find this absolute absolutely fantastic and quite intriguing um, that the boar was the animal associated with both Freyr and Freya. It was a symbol of the Vanir cult. But the Swedes, who greatly worshipped Freyr at Uppsala as the founder of their royal dynasty, during the 6th century had boar helmets, some of which from this period seem to have been almost boar masks. Such an, uh, an elaborate type of helmet seems unlikely to have been used in combat, since it would have been easily taken off or take out of, of balance uh, the person wearing it with a blow to the boar itself on the top. Um, it is possible that these helmets were used in specific ceremonies during the cult of Freyr, possibly used by a figure of great power, like a king, which served, uh, served as the, the head of the god himself and through which the god would speak through the mouth of the wearer of the helmet. As we have in other cultures, the use of the mask that represents a specific deity and the deity speaks through the person wearing its mask. The deity possessing the wearer of the mask or helmet and through this greatly ritualized process, divinatory work was conducted. It's a possibility. Alright, my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed this second part of divination in the Germanic world. Thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. And as always, Takurio! <laughs>